everyone, and welcome to Dignified Resilience. The main subject of this episode is not a person. Um, it's a set of related themes and, well, humans and people who make the story of Sarajevo Haggadah that we will talk about today so beautiful, inspiring, and eternally fascinating. The Sarajevo Haggadah is the most celebrated uh, Passover Haggadah in the world, probably the most famous medieval illustrated Hebrew manuscript. The Haggadah, uh, which Hebrew, in Hebrew is, means story and account, it's a collection of religious rules and traditions arranged into the order of the cedar observed on Passover, which for the Jews is the holiday celebrating the liberation of um, the Jewish slavery in Egypt. In 2003, a Bosnia and Herzegovina proclaimed uh, Sarajevo Haggadah as a national monument. Uh, movable national monument. And then years later in 2017, it was registered by UNESCO as a um, documentary heritage to the memory of the World Register, providing official recognition to the importance worldwide. Um, many Bosnians, including myself, but also so many people who are not Bosnian, but who appreciate Sarajevo and its history and people, truly value and um, hold in very high regard this book because they connect, it, they connect the spirit of the Haggadah um, with, with the city that, that we all love. So this episode is my personal humble contribution um, towards preservation of the beautiful story and the celebration of the values tied to uh, the Sarajevo Haggadah and the people who had saved it. Um, in World War II and in the war in the 1990s. So this book endured the Inquisition, then one to Italy, it did not get burned as it received this signature of approval from the um, Catholic Inquisitor. Then it was brought to Sarajevo uh, in Bosnia. And then in 1894, Joseph Cohen's family sold it to the National Museum. And then it was sent to Vienna to be restored. In Vienna, the uh, two German scholars produced a facsimile of the Haggadah with introductory essays. But then it survived again, World War II, uh, brutal siege of Sarajevo from 92 to 95. So one time after another, the book survived as did Sarajevo, thanks to God's protection, as some might think, thanks to many brave people all along throughout geographies, who found a way to preserve it and who appreciated it um, and who knew the value of it for, for the humanity. So in this episode today, we will hear, we'll have two parts. In the first part, we will hear, um, and we're joined by one of the world-renowned academic experts on Sarajevo Haggadah, Professor David Stern from Harvard University. And we will be joined also by Dr. Hikmet Karcic, who is a Bosnian genocide researcher and the author of a recently published biography of Dervish Korkut, the Bosniak, uh, Bosnian Muslim who, man who, ris uh, who risked his life to save the Sarajevo Haggadah in World War II, and who is today celebrated as he should as the epitome of goodness and well of dignified resilience in the face of Nazis at that time. Uh, scholarship on Sarajevo Haggadah is abundant, but this book and stories related to it are an incessant source of conversations, lively discussions, and intriguing puzzles that remain unsolved. Tell us more about the book's history, its gorgeous illustrations and text, the meaning of it. We're joined today with one of the greatest experts on the topic, uh, Professor David Stern, uh, Harry Starr, Professor of Classical and Modern Jewish and Hebrew Literature and Professor of Comparative Literature, uh, Director also of the Center for Jewish Studies at Harvard University, and the author most recently of the Jewish Bible uh, Material History, published in 2017. As um, just a snippet of his long, impressive official CV, I'll share that uh, the main topic of Professor Stern's scholarship is the nature of Jewish uh, literary, literary creativity, within its uh, larger historical and cultural context. I'm so thankful that you found the time for us today, Professor Stern, um, to share some of your expertise on this topic. 
Um, welcome to Dignified Resilience. I'll start by asking, how are you today? Fine. Um, and thank you very much for inviting me. I'm very honored to be here at Dignified Resilience. Um, yeah, let's dive in. I, I think it would be wonderful if uh, from the very start we could um, share with our listeners uh, a little bit more about the historical background of the Sarajevo Haggadah uh, or what it's known of it in, in terms of Catalonia in 14th century and how can we also contextualize the Sarajevo Haggadah within the framework of Iber Iberian Jewish book culture? Okay, well, let me begin with even the larger picture. Um, during the Middle Ages, there are two main centers of Jewish culture in Europe. Um, one of them is in Central Europe, Germany, and nor Northern France mainly, called Ashkenaz. And the other is in the Iberian Peninsula, as well as Southern France, and to some extent, North Africa. And that is known as Sfarad. Um, Sfarad, uh, has basically begins in the 10th century, 11th century, and ends in 1492 with the expulsion of Jews of the Jews from Spain. Um, it basically undergoes two periods. The first is under Muslim Islamic rule, uh, which goes until the the uh, beginning of the uh, 13th century. And then under Christian rule, uh, basically after that, until the expulsion, uh, though different parts of Spain fall under Christian rule earlier or later than that one blanket date. Um, the earlier Islamic period is often known as the golden age of Sephardic Jewry though both periods are really periods of extraordinary cultural achievement in the history of Spanish Jewish culture. Um, but the Islamic culture, the Islamic period sort of lends most of Sephardic Jewish culture, even through the Christian period, its main character. It, it views it with a very special character, and we'll see that even in the Sarajevo Haggadah. The uh, Sarajevo Haggadah was written in the beginning of the 14th century, that is a well into the middle of the Christian period. Uh, it was composed in the north of Spain, somewhere in Catalonia, um, probably near Granada, because there's one page in it which has the coat of arms of the rulers of Granada. Uh, the 14th, the first half of the 14th century was a uh, turbulent period in Spanish Jewish history. Uh, from the beginning of the 14th century um, till the end of the 14th century, Jews were under persecution, but even so, um, uh, and in the middle of there were there was an intense wave of persecutions and forced conversions. The Sarajevo Agado was produced sometime before that, we don't know exactly when. Um, but even so, during this entire period, there was many, many great cultural achievements produced during that period. And then after that period of persecutions, uh, cultural creativity again picked up until really the very end, right before the expulsion in 1492. Um, we have today surviving seven illustrated Haggadot, which all have one specific shape, and the Sarajevo Haggadah is one of them. And what's unusual about these Haggadot is that they all begin with a, uh, a series of small pictures called miniatures. But it's not, the, mini the word miniature doesn't mean that they're small. It means that they're based on minium, which is a kind of die that's used as a sort of foundation for the pictures. Um, but they precede the text of the Haggadah itself. Now, the Haggadah is the ritual prayer book that is used as a script for the Seder, which is the ritual banquet that is held 
on the first two nights of Passover. Passover is the spring holiday that celebrates, well, both the beginning of the spring, but within Jewish tradition, the exodus, the night of the exodus of the, Jew, of the Israelites from Egypt and their liberation by God from servitude in Egypt. So it's really the holiday of Jewish freedom. And that it's celebrated, as I just said, by two ritual banquets, which, and at these banquets, the story of the Exodus from Egypt is retold in through the text of this book called the Haggadah. Mm -hmm. Now, in the Spanish Haggadot, in addition to having the text of the Haggadah, you find a series of illustrations which precede the actual text. And then the text itself, as we'll see when we look at the Sarajevo Haggadah, is decorated and illuminated and sometimes illustrated with pictures, um, truly spectacular illustrations. And all seven of the surviving Haggadot are really spectacular books. And together they really represent a, an extraordinary cultural achievement. And, uh, and since their discovery in the late 19th century, uh, they really have been recognized as one of the great cultural achievements of Spanish Jewish culture. Um, now, the Sarajevo Haggadah is, owes its fame to the fact that it was the first one of these Haggadot mm -hmm. to be discovered. Mm -hmm. And in fact, it was the very first illustrated yeah. Jewish book to actually come to the attention of both Jewish and Western scholars. Now, previous to this, it was often believed that Jews did not um, create figurative art because of the prohibition of the second commandment, which commands the Jews not to worship any sort of image. Is that Exodus 24? Uh, yeah, I don't know the verse, but that sounds right. It's Exodus 20. Mm -hmm. um, and in chapter 20, and then in, among the Ten Commandments. Mm -hmm. and that was often understood to prohibit the making of any sort of figurative image. But that was a real misunderstanding of that verse. What that verse prohibits is the worshiping mm -hmm. of any image. Mm -hmm. It doesn't prohibit the making of any image. And once the Sarajevo Haggadah was discovered, and many other manuscripts began to come to light, which had also had figurative representations. Mm -hmm. And then in the 20th century, various excavations, both in the land of Israel and also in, um, in elsewhere in the Near East, in Syria, for example, a synagogue called Dura Europus was excavated, which is full of illustrations on the walls of the synagogue. But synagogues in Israel were excavated, which have mosaic floors with figurative representations. So it's very clear that there's an entire tradition of Jewish art making that goes back very, very early to the time of the ancient rabbis, the very beginning of classical Judaism. Mm -hmm. um, it's not continuous. And you can't say that Jews everywhere made art, but they continued to make art throughout history. And, uh, and every culture, both in Ashkenaz and Germany and Northern France, they have their own artistic style. In Sfarad, they have their own. In North Africa, they have their own. In Italy, they have their own. Each culture usually creates its art in the image of the art of the majority culture in which the Jews are living. This is true of Jewish book art in general. Jewish books always tend to reflect the books of the majority culture in which the Jews producing their books tend to live. 
And as a result, the Spanish, the, the Sephardic Jewish books um, tend to reflect the books that were produced in Spain. Um, and because even during the Christian period, even Christian culture continued to be influenced by the Islamic style that had really shaped Spanish culture during the Islamic period of its rule. Um, there's a thing called Mudijar style, which is, mm -hmm. Mudijar is a term for Muslims who live under Christian rule and they developed their own uh, special Islamicizing style. Christians adapt that, so do Jews. Mm -hmm. So as we'll see when we look at the Sarajevo Haggadah, you find both uh, some aspects of the art reflect Latin Christian books, but other types of the art and the script looks very much like Arabic script. You know, it reflects that influence. So it's a very mixed sort of influ picture of influence, both from Islam and from Islamic books and from Christian books. But it really does reflect the influence of the cultures, the diasporic cultures in which the Jews are living. And in Germany and Northern France, the Jewish books looked like Latin Gothic books mm -hmm. during that same period. And in Italy in the 16th century, they looked like Italian humanistic books. Mm -hmm. The Sarajevo Haggadah has this, it's really an extraordinarily beautiful book. And it came to, it, it, it first gained its fame because it was the first of these books to actually come to the world's attention and it showed everybody that there was Jewish art. Yeah, uh, that, thank you. Thank you for mentioning yeah. that uh, because uh, it's very, it's really fascinating. And you touched upon, it was, I think, the first facsimile of an illustrated medieval Hebrew book, as you said, ever to be published when the Haggadah was sent to Vienna, right? Uh, right. So there, after, so then, Sarah Ye, so it was, it was actually, um, it, it belonged to a, uh, a Sephardic family named the Cone family. Right. Uh, we don't know where the Cone family, how it came, how they came to own it. Yeah. Um, the story, but this is, you know, nobody knows if it's really true, mm -hmm. is that they were very, very poor mm -hmm. and they had no money and needed money, mm -hmm. period. And their son brought it, the book, to his Jewish school to the principal and said, would you like to buy it? Mm -hmm. And the principal looked at the book and said, you can get a lot more money for this than anything I could pay you. Let's take it to the National Museum. Mm -hmm. And they took it to the National Museum and the National Museum bought it. I have no idea what they paid for it. I don't know if anybody knows what they paid for it. Right. Uh, I'm sure they did not pay anything near what it's actually worth. But I don't think anybody really knew what it was worth then. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, because it was actually the first book of its sort that had been found. Um, and uh, Serio then was part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. So almost as soon as the National Museum got it, they sent it to Vienna to be studied by a group of scholars, including a Jewish scholar named David Kaufmann who was an extraordinary, he was a very brilliant young scholar and uh, he was actually a very distant relative of mine. Oh, uh, okay. But none of, it, none of his brilliance rubbed off, believe me. <laughs> right, Hungarian um, Jewish from what I know, right? Is it correct? Pardon? Is he Hungarian? Was he Hungarian? Yeah, he was, he was in Budapest. Mm -hmm. um, he actually, he was married to a relative of mine. I'm, I'm really not related to him. <laughs> And he, he, he was also a great book collector. Mm -hmm. um, and he was a really, truly great scholar. And he wrote the first books actually on Jewish art. The first article, which is about the Sarajevo Haggadah is the very first, uh, I mean, it's actually a kind of short monograph. Mm -hmm. It's the first monograph on Jewish art. And uh, it really caused a major sensation because nobody knew these things existed before this. And, uh, you know, and then they started discovering other manuscripts. And uh, now what's interesting is that not only does the second commandment not prohibit 
the making of representational art, but that virtually all Jewish art that exists is found in either prayer books or within other liturgical contexts like synagogues. Mm -hmm. So not only were they not afraid that Jews would work, not, would not, you know, they were not afraid that Jews would worship images. It seems that Jews used images as a way to enhance prayer to God, mm. which is actually true of, you know, Christianity and Muslims clearly use decoration as a way to enhance their worship of God. I mean, go into any mosque. Mm. You know, look at the role that calligraphy plays in Qurans. Mm -hmm. And we, there's, uh, the story of Joseph is giving a special attention on the 17 panels in particular, right? In right, okay, so the 17 panels, um, what they do is they begin with the, um, the series, they begin with, they tell the biblical story. Now, now the Sarajevo Haggadah is the only one of the seven to begin with the creation of the world. world. And then it goes through the entire book of Genesis and the first part of Exodus, the slavery of the Jews in Egypt, the birth of Moses, um, you know, the, the Jews going down into Egypt and the entire Joseph story. story. Um, uh, well, the, the entire Joseph story, then the Jews going down into Egypt, their slavery, and then the Exodus, and then they're coming out. And all the series end with a group of pictures that depict Jews in, contempor in contemporary Spain preparing for Passover and preparing the food for that ritual banquet, the Seder. Mm -hmm. And the last picture is always a picture of the Jews leaving the synagogue and coming home. home. And the page that follows that is actually the, page, the first page of text with the blessing over wine, which is actually the, the page that initiates, that begins the text of the Haggadah. Of the, of, the tech, of the ritual itself, the ritual banquet itself. Right. Now, um, in that, so now the, uh, the Sarajevo Haggadah is the only one of these seven Haggadot that begins with the creation of the world. The other ones begin either with uh, the birth of Moses or with the Jews going down to Egypt. Um, and either they pay a lot of attention to the figure of Moses, or as in this case, in the Sarajevo Agata, with the figure of Joseph. Now, what do Joseph and Moses both have in common? They're both Jewish youths who grow up in the courts of pharaohs, Gentile rulers. You know, and they're both sort of Jewish princes who grow up in the courts of Gentile rulers. Now, in Spain, Jews, aristocratic Jews, often served as courtiers for both the Islamic and later the Christian rulers 
of the various kingdoms and you know provinces and cities of mm -hmm. the various Spanish you know uh, provinces and kingdoms. And they also they lived just as the Islamic or the Christian rulers had courts, so too these Jewish courtiers had their own courts. And the Christian or Islamic kings patronized philosophers, poets, artists, and commissioned books. So too, the Jewish courtiers also patronized philosophers, artists, poets, and they too commissioned books. And it's very likely that these Haggadot, which were very expensive books, uh, they're decorated with gold leaf. Uh, they would have cost the price of a very, very nice home <laughs> in a suburb today. Um, uh, they, they were quite expensive. It's very likely that they commissioned these books. And the figure of Joseph or the figure of Moses may in fact represent them hmm. within this, you know, within the Jewish community. Hmm. Um, so, uh, I yeah. I wanted to ask you, uh, from what I've gathered, I read that it may have been a present for the wedding for members of two prominent families, Shoshan and El Azar, uh, because their coat of arms, uh, a shield with a rosette, rose, which Shoshan in Hebrew, from what I read, and a wing, which was uh, El Azar in Hebrew, they're featured on the page showing the coat of arms of the city of Barcelona. So I was wondering, um, I, was it, as I asked you kind of uh, when we talked about it a little bit, was it usual or unusual that we also don't know the exact names of the original uh, or even the new owners afterwards? Um, was, we know that the book left uh, after the Jews were expelled from Spain in 1492 and then it went on to Italy. But just so our listeners gathered, um, was it unusual, usual, or there's no usual and unusual in terms of the lack of knowledge on the ownership? Yeah, th there's, um, there's no usual, there's no unusual. Um, scribes, th the way we know who the original owner or the patron or commissioner, the person who actually, books are, medieval manuscripts, um, scribes don't write them and then try to sell them. Mm -hmm. um, in the Middle Ages, either a, some, a, somebody commissions a scribe, a professional scribe to write a manuscript, or a learned person wants to have a book and copies it for him or herself, okay? Now, if a professional, if, if a wealthy person or someone commissions a scribe to write the manuscript for them, very frequently at the very end of the manuscript, there's a small paragraph called a colophon in which the scribe identifies himself, says when he wrote it, says what the book is, often says, tells us how long it took him to write it, and then tells us who he wrote it for, and then often blesses the patron with all sorts of blessings for the patron, his family, his children, and so on. So that's how we know, and, and he often gives the place where he wrote it or where the patron lives. Mm -hmm. And that's, usually, that's how we know, you know, where these books actually originated. Um, but there's no fast or hard rule that says you have to have a colophon. And unhappily, this Haggadah does not have a colophon. What we do have is the page that you mentioned which uh, yeah, is this page here. Mm -hmm. And can you show us again, please, Professor? So it's, this, it's this very beautiful architectural page, which page, which frames 
uh, what is uh, the actual beginning of the the real text, not the blessings that begin the ritual banquet, but the real text of the story of the exodus from Egypt. Uh, it's a passage that begins, this is a bread of, aff of affliction. And it's a reference to the matzah, the unleavened bread, which uh, is eaten at the Seder. And on the very top of the page, you have this shield which is the shield that was originally the, the city, the coat of arms of Barcelona, and then became the uh, shield of the kings of Aragon. And then at the very bottom of the page, you have this floret, which um, is also the, uh, the coat of arms or the insignia of Margaret, the queen of Aragon. And on this side, on the bottom, or in the other side on the bottom, you have this wing here. It's a little difficult to see. That is the um, uh, the coat of arms of the Sanz family. Now I didn't know that there were that they were also maybe they're identified with two Jewish families as well. Mm -hmm. um, and I didn't I didn't know that. And it could be that it would sort of celebrate the marriage of these two families. I don't know that. Mm -hmm. um, the the flower, if it, if it is a rose, Shoshan could actually be the name of a family. Um, that's possible. I thought it was very interesting because, um, you, as you said, it, it Haggadah is standard for family use and it has both the passages from... Yeah, it, it's, it's not impossible mm -hmm. um, because Jews did use books of that sort. Certainly later on, um, they used books as wedding gifts and they would not inside the book so much. Uh, well, sometimes books were given, prayer books were given to brides and mm -hmm. were dedicated to brides. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and sometimes they would make silver covers and one side of the silver covers would have the coat of arms of one family and the other side would have the coat of arms of the other family. Right. So, you know, the bride and the groom's family. So it's possible. For me, it was very moving and beautiful to read one of the last paragraphs um, of your article on redemption in Catalonia and Bosnia, where you write that um, you never thought that it was the most beautiful or um, the most important illustrated um, Haggadah until you saw it in person in Sarajevo. So I think it would be uh, great, and I know only bits of the story, um, for our listeners to learn um, when did you, how, how many times did you go to Sarajevo, how did you see it, and your experience uh, with the Haggadah. I'm fascinated that you actually gain access to it um, and all the impressions oh left on you. So um, mm. could you tell us a little bit more about that as well? Well, as um as you said in the beginning, one of uh, my major field of research is the Jewish book. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and one of the books that I've really worked on a lot is the Passover Haggadah. And, um, and I've taught the Sarajevo Haggadah numerous times. I own, I think, every one of the facsimiles that's been produced. Uh, and uh, it's a great Haggadah, and, but I've always thought that it's a great Haggadah, not because, I, I, not, I haven't been so impressed by its beauty. Um, there are some other Haggadot which are also incredibly beautiful. Um, there's one called the Darmstadt Haggadah, which is nearly all gold leaf, which is really, really spectacular. Uh, there's another, the Golden Haggadah, uh, which is also Spanish. It's similar to the Sarajevo uh, from the same period, which is very beautiful. There is one from Germany called the Bird's Head Haggadah, where all the figures have the heads of bird-like creatures, which is incredibly interesting. So I never, I never was so, you know, bowled over by the actual material features of the Sarajevo Haggadah. What was always so impressive about the Sarajevo Haggadah was its history. 
and all the legends that accrue to it. Um, you know, they say that uh, Franz Joseph was on his way to see the Sarajevo Haggadah in the museum with his wife when he was assassinated, you know, and World War I was basically instigated. Um, uh, there's, you know, there's more urban legends attached to this book than almost to any other book. Um, uh, and then the great stories of how it was nearly destroyed during, you know, first, how it actually came to the museum, how this little boy brought it to school to sell. There's other stories like that. And not all of them end happily. There are stories where great manuscripts were used as kindling mm -hmm. and actually burned because people needed them to cook food. Right. Um, and, and manuscripts were actually taken out of fires um, because, you know, before they were completely burned. Um, but, you know, it, it, that's part of the story. And then how during World War II, it was rescued by the Muslim uh, curator of the museum. Yeah. And then during the Bosnian, you know, war, um, it was also saved by the curator of the museum. Uh, so it really, you know, and, and the whole tortured history of Sarajevo, uh, it really carries the baggage of an enormous amount of history. Um, and because the Haggadah is the Jewish book of redemption par excellence, it's really the Jewish book about history about imagining historical redemption. And it's a book that very much shows how much redemption is tied to the experience of diaspora. Because Jews have created Haggadot basically everywhere they've lived for the entire length of the entire history of their life in the diaspora. And if you look at the entire series of Haggadot that they've created over, say, the last thousand years, you can see how their ideas of redemption have changed. Mm -hmm. You know, by looking at the different Haggadot, sometimes at the text, it's, even the text has changed, but certainly the physical shape, the illustrations change. And you see, because these Jewish books invariably reflect the majority cultures, in which the Jews live, you see how much their ideas of redemption, the way they literally picture redemption, changes and is shaped by the diaspora in which they live and their diasporic existence. So you see how much redemption and diaspora are tied together in the Jewish imagination. And in the Sarajevo Haggadah, because of its actual diasporic history, mm -hmm. which is so uh, charged, mm -hmm. this fact takes on a special meaning. So that's what it always really seemed to me to be so powerful about the book. Now, I was writing a book, a history, I call it an unsystematic history of the Jewish book. And what I've done is I basically have chosen 150 specific books from the Dead Sea Scrolls down to some sort of digital platform that's around today. And I'm writing, but specific books, you know, copies of books or specific manuscripts. And I'm writing little mini biographies of each one of them. And through these biographies, I plan to tell the story of the Jewish book from the beginning to the end or told today, as it were. And I'm trying to see each one of these books that I'm writing about, because it's a great excuse to travel places. So one of the books, of course, is the Sarajevo Haggadah. I mean, there's no way to write about a Spanish Haggadah without writing about the, the Sarajevo Haggadah. That is the Sephardi Haggadah. So I had to go to Sarajevo to see it. So I wrote to the director of the museum and, uh, and said, I'd like to come and look at the Sarajevo Haggadah. 
And he wrote back, he said, uh, well, you can come and see it, but you can't study it. Mm -hmm. uh, you can look at a digital facsimile that we have of it. So I wrote back to him and I said, well, I'm not coming to Sarajevo to look at a digital facsimile. I said, I don't have to study it, but I really would like to look at it seriously. Mm -hmm. um, he wrote back, he said, well, as I said, you can look at it seriously, but if you want to study it, you have to use the digital facsimile. But by then I had already made plans to go and I bought a ticket what and uh, I figured I would go. How so, many years ago was this? Pardon me? How many years ago was this? It was four years ago, I think. Mm -hmm. And this when I went there, I really had no idea what was going to happen. Well, I get to Sarajevo, I check into my uh, hotel, and, um, uh, and I think I spent the night there. And the next morning at nine o'clock, I go to the museum, and the librarian, this very, very nice woman, uh, meets me at the entrance, and she says, follow me. And she takes me into this room, and there's a wooden table, and there lying on the table is the Sarajevo Haggadah. And we sat there for two hours. I did not touch it. She turned the pages, and there was another man, a conservator, who sat there um, as well. Um, but she turned the pages, and we looked at every page. And it was like seeing God. It was a total revelation. Um, I'd never had this, I've, I've seen a thousand manuscripts. I had never had this experience before. Um, it was the uh, German Jewish philosopher, Walter Benjamin, um, has this very, very famous essay called the, uh, the Work of Art in the Age of Mechanical Reproduction, in which he talks about the aura that surrounds handwritten or hand-created works of art or manuscripts, books, all of which is, and this aura is, is totally lost with mechanical reproductions. Well, I saw the aura when I looked at the Sarajevo Haggadah. And you just look at the book differently when, than when you look at a facsimile. It, it's, the, it's talking to you. It's like a person there. You see the brush strokes. You see things on the page that you never would have noticed before. Little details, you know, figures that you would not have noticed before. Um, the doodles on the pages. Um, there are these pages where a child, um, between the pages of the miniatures, um, a child doodle. He practiced his handwriting. I don't know what he was writing. Here on another page, it's even clearer. Um, here in the upper, it's like a two or an S. Can you believe it? But this is a book that shows you that, you know, people used it. But I had never noticed that before flipping the pages, but when you, when you're, when it's there, it's talking to you and you see it. Um, it was, it was a total revelation. Yeah, it's, it's incredible. So, and uh, I mean, let's just remind the, the listeners that since 2017, it was registered as UNESCO uh, as documentary uh, heritage to the memory of the world register, uh, kind of providing recognition to the importance worldwide, worldwide, of course, aside um, the importance of it for the Jewish people and for all, I think, Sarajevans who, uh, and Bosnians um, who are, I think, proud and who hold in such high regard um, and value this, um, the spirit of Haggadah as one of the symbols of the city, um, that we all love or like you mentioned i mean the book has endured so much from the inquisition and then it's interesting when you mentioned the burning of the books i i remember reading that um 
when it was in the north of Italy, it was, uh, it did not get burned because it received a signature of approval from a Catholic inquisitor. So, well, not, not approval, it was censored on the, on the last page. Censors, if you pay the censor to, um, here's the censor's uh, signature on the very bottom. Uh, it was, uh, it was uh, Domenico Vistorini. Um, you pay the censor to censor the book if you didn't pay him to censor the book, then he took it and he destroyed it. Wow. Yeah. That was, it was a job that he, that's how he got paid. If you were really unlucky, you had to pay a censor on Monday and then another censor showed up on Tuesday and you had to pay him too to censor it. But- uh, He survived, he passed, he passed the test. It wasn't a, a sign of approval, it was a, it was a way to keep the book. Okay. Uh, so, uh, but he, he did not censor anything in the book. Um, and of course, this is something, I mean, I, I'm curious about the discussions about one, there's one feature in the Sarajevo Haggadah pictures that has kind of remained, I believe, a subject of discussion within the Jewish communities and scholars. And that is that uh, dark skinned female image. Right female figure in the lower left hand corner of the page that illustrates the family and the Passover cedar meal. So right. So right. Well, a little bit about it and I'm curious to hear your thoughts. I stumbled upon um, one article by Adam Cohen uh, named Freedom and Slavery in the Sarajevo Haggadah. So um, in this article, he offers an analysis of the figure, and I quote, he says, one that overturns liberal modern interpretations and points instead to a more contentious medieval context. Um, so there are some scholarly arguments that this figure is a slave. Um, then there, is, there are discussions from what I gather that it's less certain what she's doing in this picture of the family cedar. So I was curious about um, your thoughts and is this uh, a subject of lively contentious within the Jewish communities in terms of different interpretations? How? Um... Well, so it's not, yeah, I, I mean, it hasn't been, I wouldn't call it contentious. Um, it's usually, people noticed it and they noticed that there was this, you know, clearly African looking dark white woman sitting at the Seder table she's visibly different than all the other white people um, sitting at the table. And, uh, and there's been discussion of what she's doing there. And, you know, and most people in the initial suggestion was that either she was a convert and most likely people suggested, well, she was either a slave who had been freed and converted or she was a servant who had converted and was now part of the family, but everybody pointed to the fact that she was now part of the Seder and, uh, and that this was really a picture of inclusiveness, how even a servant, even a converted servant, even a converted black servant was part of the Jewish family. Um, now, Adam Cohn recently published this article that you mentioned um, where he really questioned whether this was such an inclusive picture and whether the point of the picture was inclusiveness. Um, and uh, he suggested, he pointed out a number of things. One is that she's not really sitting at the table. She's sitting in front of the table and she's a little bit below everybody else. Um, it's not clear what she's holding in her hand. Um, uh, but she seems to be in a somewhat inferior or subservient position relative to the other people seated at the table. Um, but most tellingly, he pointed to a passage in Maimonides as a key to what her position at the table might be. Now, this picture is on the page where the meal, where the family is about to eat the meal. 
eat the matzah. Now, the unleavened bread. Now, at the Seder, when you eat the unleavened bread, when you eat most of the ritual foods, it's customary to recline. Now, originally, people reclined because that's the way that Romans ate at banquets. But after the Jews ceased to live within a Roman environment, nobody knew why people reclined at the Seder. So different interpretations came up. And the most common one is the one that's offered by Maimonides, which is that reclining shows that you're a freed person rather than a slave. Okay, so if you want to show that you've actually left Egypt and are free, you recline rather than sit upright, which is the way a slave eats. Okay, and this is why we recline and at the Seder, everybody is supposed to imagine themselves as though they have been freed from Egypt, that they themselves went out of Egypt and are now freed from slavery. Now this woman sitting there is not reclining. I mean, the people at the table also don't really look too much like they're reclining, but one assumes that they're slightly reclining. But Maimonides says on this page, uh, you know, on, in his, in his uh, code of law, that you should say, I recline because I am a freed person, not like this slave or this maidservant who is not free and does not sit reclining. And he says, that's what this picture illustrates. She's there to show the other people at the table what it's like to sit at the table and not be free and not recline. So this isn't really quite a picture of inclusiveness. And we know that Jews actually were slave owners as most aristocratic people or anybody who could afford to own a slave in Spain, you know, Christians were at that time, they owned Muslim Spain, they owned Muslims or North Africans mm -hmm. as slaves. Um, so uh, it's a much more, you know, realistic picture and points to, you know, a historical collect complexity in the Haggadah. Um, I, I talked about that series of miniatures that precede the Haggadah, that go from the creation up until the Haggadah itself. That too is not just simply Bible stories. Mm -hmm. um, those miniatures uh, actually mirror a very similar type of series of miniatures, small pictures like that, that are found in Christian Psalters of the 12th and 13th century, books of Psalms. Now books of Psalms, the book of Psalms was believed to have been written by David. And David, of course, is the ancestor of Christ. So Christ himself was viewed as a kind of uh, typological prefigurement of Christ. And usually in these books of Psalms, these Psalters, you often have a series of pictures which illustrate points of, of David's life, which point to the life of Christ and show the continuity between David and Christ. But they're very, very similar series of pictures. And art historians have recognized for quite a while that these illuminations, these pictures in the Haggadot are modeled on these Psalter pictures. But more recently, an Israeli art historian named Sarit Shalei Veni has used this fact to make a much more interesting argument. Um, the beginning of the 14th century, when this Haggadah is being composed, also sees the rise of a new religious phenomenon in Europe, and especially in Spain, the rise of mendicant friars. Uh, these are mainly Dominicans and, uh, and uh, Franciscans. These are friars who travel around and preach. 
you know, they're no longer living in monasteries. They're like monks, but now they travel among communities, people, and they missionize and they preach. And they try to convert Jews as well. But one of their main topics of their sermons is that today's Jews, as I say, the Jews who are living then in 14th century Spain, among the Christians then, are not the same as the Jews who lived during Christ's time. Now, up until then, the official church doctrine had been that the church should protect the Jews because the Jews are one, the protectors of the Old Testament. Two, they're the people out of which Christ came. And three, they're living proof of what happens to someone, a people who rejects Christ. Okay, and ironically, paradoxically, these were all reasons not to destroy Jews. But let them live in subjection, in poverty, in poor conditions, as an oppressed people, but keep them alive. These friars began to preach, no, no, no. These Jews you see today, these are not the same as the Jews out of which Christ came. These are not the Jews of the Bible. These are not the Jews who protect the Old Testament. These are Talmudic Jews. These are Jews who observe all sorts of laws that are against the Bible, that actually are offensive to Christians. They obey a book called the Talmud, which has all sorts of teachings that insult Christianity and that are offensive to Christians. What Saricha Levini argues is that these miniatures which show the history of the Bible, either from the birth of Moses or from the creation of the world, going seamlessly from the beginning to the Seder, basically illustrate the fact that we are the direct heirs of the Bible. We are the true heirs. The Bible is ours. We are the same. This is our heritage. So what you see actually that the Haggadah itself has this real polemical side against contemporary Christianity as well. Yeah. It's so this is a book that really, you know, it carries history on all sorts of different levels. Absolutely. And you mentioned earlier that there is also their Christian influences, their decorative Arabic elements. Right. And the traditional Jewish iconography. So it's both conflictive and um, I mean, it shows a, a, a great dynamic in terms of interactions. What are, Professor, um, as, we, as we go a little bit towards the end of this first part of my podcast, what are the new directions of research that are going on um, in terms of Sarajevo Haggadah now? What, uh, what are researchers working on um, right now? Well, in terms of the Sarajevo Haggadah, I think uh, the major research is m now to really um, contextualize this Haggadah and the other Haggadot like it more within the, um, you know, the, the historical context of Iberia. Uh, I mean, all of Sephardic culture is being really reevaluated. Uh, as much of medieval Jewry is being reevaluated. Uh, the relations between Jews and their surrounding Gentile culture is undergoing major revisions. Um, and, uh, and this material has never really, it's never really been part of the larger scholarly discussion. So it really has to be assimilated into this larger scholarly discussion. And that's where I think most of the research in the future will really go. Um, so. Great. Um, well, 
thank you so much, uh, Professor Stern. I, um, in the second part of the podcast, we will also host Dr. Hikmet Karcic from Sarajevo, who recently published uh, the a biography of Darvish Korkut, the man who saved the Haggadah in World War II. And so we will get a closer look both about who this man was, um, what, what inspired him to act because it was a consistency in his behavior that we see in terms of um, acting even before 1942, uh, writing resolutions against uh, persecution of Jews and uh, Roma in, in Bosnia. So um, I look forward to, to that as well. And of course, um, as I mentioned, Sarajevo Haggadah for us, um, Bosnians and Sarajevans, it's, a, it's also a symbol of coexistence given the story involves uh, so many different cultures and touching Jews and Christians and Muslims. And again, of course, it, it's additional testimony to the existence of uh, Jewish community for so long um, in, in, in our city. Um, is there anything else that, I mean, th there's so much that we could talk about more that you would like to add about Sarajevo Haggadah to all of those who will um, observe and listen to you from their own perspectives, which vary, um, both in terms of background culturally and um, religiously and um, in terms of just... Let me just show you one page. Um... So like, here's a page with, at the bottom of the page, you see this figure? Yes. Uh, this man with a tail. A tail. That's the kind of figure that you'll find in a Christian missal, a Latin book. These kinds of weird creatures were like these, these dragons with their tails meeting. Did you see that? Mm -hmm. But if you look at the, the letters, they have these like scimitar uh, feet, legs. They go down like in swooshes. That's very much like Arabic letters. And they have these elongated necks. It's very Arabicized. So um, on the same page, you see both the Christian and the, the Latin and the Arabic influence. Fascinating. So on that note, I... Uh, I want to um, thank you for your time. Um, and I want to, um, I hope that our listeners gather just, just a little bit of new information. I mean, there are some puzzles as, that we will probably never able, be able to solve, how it got from Italy to uh, Sarajevo, et cetera. But um, it remains fascinating nevertheless. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Stern, for your time again. and. Um, Anything else? No, I think I've said enough. <laughs> thank you. Okay, um, thank you. <laughs>